Are you ready for the word this morning? Yes. Let's go ahead and uh, pray. We're going to pray and then jump right into 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to continue where we left off last week. Heavenly Father, oh, we are so thankful and grateful, Father, and for another opportunity to get into your word. We look to the Holy Spirit who is our teacher and guide. And Father, we thank you for giving us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying. We thank you for bringing fresh revelation from your word. And I thank you for utterance, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're continuing the series on, uh, on uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, I call this whole series God's Grace at Work. How does grace look? when it's working or, or in people's lives, when it's affecting people. And so that's why I'm calling this series God's Grace at Work. But today, the topic today in chapter 3, I'm calling it God's Glory Revealed in the New Testament. God's Glory Revealed in the New Testament. Now, Paul, the last chapter, if we were here last week, remember, he was having to defend himself and, and, uh, because, you know, they, he had to explain to them why he hadn't come right away. Because he had written that first letter to correct that, je that man that was sleeping with his, with his dad's mom. Hello? <laughs> and the church had done nothing about it. And so he, he's bringing correction. But, but he, was, he, he wanted them to take care of it before he showed up. Because he didn't want to come like a disciplinarian. Hey, you need to stop doing this or whatever. He wanted them to take care of it and realize what was the right thing to do. So when he would come, he says, man, you guys are the ones that bring me joy. In another uh, 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 epistle, he says, you're my, to the people, he says, you're my joy, you're my crown of rejoicing. So Paul found his joy in the people that he ministered to. So just like you don't like to correct people, he didn't like to correct people. So he, he wrote the letter hoping that they would take care of business on their own and, and mature and grow. Amen? Listen, you're not going to mature unless you make decisions on your own. Amen. Amen? A sign of maturity is when you begin to make decisions on your own. Amen. Come on, isn't that true? And so he, he, he was trying to get them to take care of business without him having to come and, oh, look, at you guys are so bad in what you're doing. And, and guess what? Titus finally caught up to him and, and Paul said, man, I heard the good news. You guys responded well to the letter. You took care of business. Now forgive the guy. Receive him. Comfort him. Restore him. Amen. Amen. We talked about forgiveness last week, how important it is to let it go so God's supply continues to flow in your life. Amen. Don't, don't, don't hang on to bitterness and all that garbage because that's what stops, stops you know, the glory and the grace of God from flowing through you. Amen. So in chapter 3, let's keep reading chapter 3, verse 1. Notice what he says. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Basically what he's saying, man, look. Do I, do I need letters of recommendation from you guys about who we are? Or, or uh, you know what I'm saying? Or, or do I need to bring a letter of recommendation to you guys to, hey, look, he's a real apostle. He's really from God. You know what I'm saying? We have that today. Sometimes when I try to do itinerary work, I try to get a letter of recommendation because people don't know you. So that another pastor vouches that he's legit. Right. right? And so that's what Paul's saying. I don't need no letter of recommendation from you guys. And I don't need to bring a letter of re recommendation from anybody else. <laughs> and look why? He says, look at verse 2. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. In other words, what he's saying, you guys are my letter of recommendation. Your life is an epistle. Your life is an open letter. Where people can look at your life and can people look at your life and see Jesus? Can people look at your life and see someone that doesn't quit serving God? Can people look at your life and say, man, you know what? He could have given up or she could have given up. But look at, look at their, they've, they've put their faith and trust in Jesus. Amen. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written. Listen, see, you're an epistle. You're an open letter. Did you know that you're speaking volumes to people whether you realize it or not? Your life, your faithfulness to come to church speaks volumes to your kids. Yeah. Amen. I'm serious. Your kids are watching what you're doing and they see if you don't go to church and when you do go to church. Now, I'm not here to judge anybody about that. I'm just saying though, you're speaking volumes to them by your actions, by what you do. You're an open letter. But here Paul's saying, it's Christ who wrote on your hearts, 
by the Spirit. Listen to what he's saying. I'm, I'm ministering the Word, but it's really Christ who's writing in your hearts. And he says, look at this. He says, Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by what? The Spirit of the living God. Isn't that awesome? The Spirit of the living God is writing in your heart. Glory to God. See, you think I'm, I'm the one. Yes, I'm preaching, I'm sharing, I'm teaching. But it's the Holy Spirit who's <coughs> writing things in your heart. Isn't that good? Listen, listen. He says, not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. See, we're not talking about the law here. You're, you're, we're not writing the law. I'm not writing the law in your heart. If I were to write the law in your heart, I'm going to cause you to sin more. Because the strength of sin is the law, the Bible says. He says, amen. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So it's the Spirit of God, as I'm speaking the word to you, that is writing in your heart what you need to hear and know. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, let's go on. Verse, uh, verse 4. And we have such trust toward Christ, or we have, tr have such trust through Christ toward God. So he's man, our faith is through Christ toward God. Look at verse 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Amen. So even though, hey, look, this is a work. In fact, in the previous chapter, he says, who's sufficient for these things? Amen? Who's sufficient? We don't peddle the word of God. He said, but who's gonna, who can handle all this stuff? He says, in this chapter, he says, our sufficiency comes from God. Let's look at this in a couple of translations. Let's put an NLT for me and then amplify it on this verse 5, if you can, for me. Notice what he says. It is not that we think that we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. Amen. Did you know that God doesn't have one person qualified on his own working for him or serving him? No. No. Your qualification and my qualification only comes through God. Amen. Not because I'm good enough in the flesh or have it all together or whatever. My qualification comes from the Lord. It's His calling. It's His anointing. And put this in the Amplified. Look at the Amplified. Such uh, is the reliance and confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Next one, yes, verse 5. Not that we are fit, qualified, and sufficient in ability of ourselves to what? To form personal judgments or to claim or count anything is coming from us. Amen. But our power and what? Ability and sufficiency are what? From God. Notice. God's power, what? Ability and what? Sufficiency is from God. Hey, look, at you could turn that around and say what? Your ability, there's A, and power, P, and S, APS. Your APS comes from God. Man, <laughs> your, your power, your ability, and your sufficiency come from God. Amen? Where's your APS from? The Lord, man. It's the Lord. Amen? And, and, and again, some people are, are trying to, they're saying, they're trying to call the, the, the APS, hey, we're lacking power. No, they say, man, all you got to do is turn the switch on. Power's there. Right? And what do we do? We turn the switch of faith. And we tap into His grace. Amen? Grace company. Right? <laughs> so we see that, right? Let's keep reading. So notice, Paul's admitting, look, everything that I do, my sufficiency comes from the Lord. My ability, my qualification comes from Him. That's why He, that's why he was so humble. Amen? Yes, I know, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> Verse 6. Verse 6. <coughs> I know some of you can't wait to get up and look in the mirror because you get better looking each day. <laughs> Verse 6. <"Who's, laughs> who also made us what? Sufficient. Come on now. God, what did God do? He made you sufficient as ministers of what? Of the new covenant. Listen. What are we ministers of? The old covenant? No. Now, do we talk about the yes? We can talk about the old covenant. We can share from the old covenant. But you're a minister of what? The new covenant, not of the what? Letter, but of what? The spirit. Why? Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Listen, you can bop people over the head with this Bible and give them the letter of the law and it'll hurt them. It'll kill them. The letter kills, but the spirit 
gives life. Even Jesus said in John 6, 63, he says, My words are spirit, he says, and life. The words that I'm speaking to you are spirit and life life. So notice, not the letter of the law, but the Spirit, it's the anointing, the Spirit of God that's writing in your hearts. It's the one who wrote the law that now writes in your heart by His Spirit. Amen. Amen. So He's not going to have you do something that contradicts His Word. He's the one that wrote it, right? So, let's, so, so notice, let's read this in the NLT and the Amplified. Look at this. He has enabled us to be ministers of this new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws. Come on now. That pretty plain? This new covenant we're in is not a covenant of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. Put, put in the Amplified. It is He who has qualified us, making us to be fit and worthy and sufficient as ministers and dispensers of what? Of a new covenant of salvation through Christ. Not ministers of the letter of the legally written code, but of what? The Spirit. That's why I always like to say again, like it says here, we are dispensers of God's grace. We go about and dispense God's grace to others. The Spirit of God dis dispenses His grace unto people. Amen? And, and so that's what we're called. Notice, not the letter, but of the Spirit. Why? Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. Amen. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now let's keep reading. Look at this, verse 7. Now, here's where we're going to enter in, into a comparison. Now, from verses 7 through 11, uh, those of you that come to the Bible study, you will get this. I got them divided, 7 through 11. This is the nice little thing you get. But, but if you don't get it, you don't come, you don't get it anymore. Just the way it is. Verse 7, look at this. But if the ministry of death, now this is amazing to me. We're going to look at a comparing sheet here. But if the ministry of what? Death, he says, written and engraved on stones. See, what is he referring to? How do you know it's talking about the law, Pastor? Because some people think that uh, not keeping the law is just referring to ceremonial law. You got to keep the Ten Commandments. It's the ceremonial law that you're not supposed to. We're not under that anymore. Or really? Then why does he call this? He says, written on stones. The Ten Commandments were written on stones. So he's referring to the Ten Commandments, not the ceremonial law. Amen? Now, so notice what he says. Uh, very interesting. He says, for the, if the ministry of death, he's calling the ministry of law death. He says, was written and engraved on stones, if it was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. <coughs> Notice, he was saying, look, there was a glory that shone on Moses after he received the Ten Commandments. But, he, but, but it was a glory that was fading away. And that's why he put a veil over him so the people wouldn't see the glory fading away. In fact, some of them were scared to come to Moses because they saw the glory on him and so Moses put the veil. Notice, you shouldn't be scared to go into the presence of God. So that shows you that the law was scary because we couldn't match up to it. We couldn't do it. We were not good enough under the law. And so Moses put a veil and that veil was passing away. And he says, it was glorious. But listen, look at verse 8. But he says in verse 8, how will not the ministry of the Spirit not be what? More glorious. You know what the NIV puts it this way. The ministry that brought death, but the, the ministry that brings the Spirit. In fact, put this verse in the Amplified for me. Look at this. In the Amplified it says it really good. Verse 8. Uh, verse 6 though. Why should not the dispensation of the Spirit, the spiritual ministry whose task it is to cause men to obtain and be governed by the Holy Spirit, be attended with much greater and much splendid glory? Put it back, verse 7, back up to verse 7 on Amplified. Now it, notice what he calls it. This dispensation of death engraved in letters on stone, there it is, the ministration of the law, was inaugurated with such glory and splendor that the Israelites were not able to look steadily at the face of Moses because of its brilliance. Go on. A glory that was to fade and what? Pass away. Then he, in verse 8 he says, how much more this what? This glory that's dispensed by the Holy Spirit. It's greater. 
There's no comparison. That's what he, so now he's going to keep sharing this thing. In fact, the Message Bible says that he calls it a government of death to, to the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant, the government of the living spirit. Now let's keep reading. Look at this. Let's go to verse uh, 9. For if the ministry of condemnation... Now, we, another comparison. He's calling the law being under condemnation. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of what? Righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Let's look, put this in the CEV for me. Verses not, verse 9. In the CV, look at this. If something that brings the death sentence, oh, look at that. Isn't that something? A minister, the law was a ministry of condemnation. Why? It was supposed to condemn you so that you would say, Man, I can't keep this. I'm not good enough. And then when Jesus comes, Oh, Jesus, save me. I can't save myself. That's all the purpose of the law to show you that you were not good enough that you were condemned by yourself and you could not make it to heaven on your own you're not good enough it would condemn you it would condemn all under sin so that therefore all who would choose to believe what Jesus did for them would be saved Amen. are you seeing that? Amen. now look at this if something that brings the death sentence is glorious that's what the law did won't something that makes us acceptable to God be even more glorious? This ministry of righteousness. See, anything that deals with the Spirit is the ministry of righteousness. Amen? It's the ministry of, of, of righteousness. The, notice, that makes us acceptable to God. Put it in the NLT for me, verse 9. Look at this. In the NLT. If the old way, which brings, what? Condemnation was glorious. How much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? Amen. The old way couldn't make you right with God. The new way made you right with God. Uh, God's Word translation calls it, if the ministry that brings punishment was glorious, how much more the ministry that brings God's approval? Now put, the, put in the CEB. Look at the CEB. If the ministry that brought condemnation has glory, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings what? That's what the ministry of the Spirit does. It brings what? Righteous. Are you seeing that? One, another translator, NCV says, the ministry that judged people guilty of sin brought glory. How much more the one that makes people right with God. The complete Jewish Bible says, if this ministry that declares people guilty was glorious, how much more this ministry that works to declare people innocent. And then the Amplified. Put the Amplified for me. For if the service that condemns... Look at this. The ministration of doom. Amen? The legion of doom. The ministration of doom had glory. How infinitely more abounding in splendor and glory must be the service that makes righteous the ministry that produces and fosters righteous, go on, living and right standing with God. And then the Message Bible says, it calls it the ministry of condemnation compared to now the ministry or the government of affirmation. The government of condemnation. Amen? We're not under condo bondo anymore. We're under the ministry of righteousness, uh, of affirmation. Are you seeing? He's comparing. If this produces death, how much more? And it was glorious. What produced death was so glorious. How much more this new covenant that we're in producing life. Now, look at this. I want you to go to the next verse. Uh, uh, verse uh, um, 10. For, for even what was made glorious had, no, glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory of that excels. Now put this in the Amplified. I love this one. Check this out in the Amplified, verse 10, in the Amplified for me. Because of the glory that excels. Indeed, in view of this fact, what once had splendor, talking about the law, the glory of the law in the face of Moses, had come to have no splendor at all. Because of the overwhelming glory that exceeds and excels, the glory of the gospel in the face of what? Jesus Christ. Amen. There's the key. The law has to do with what you have to do to measure up. It shows you God's standard. But in the new covenant, God himself shows up. You look at the face of Jesus Christ. You're looking at his face. You're not looking at some code, some law. You're looking, you're having, you're coming into the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Why have a law when you can have the one who wrote the law live on the inside of you? Come on now. Are you seeing what he's laying down here? Amen. Now let's keep reading. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. 
For if what is passing away, talking about the law, was glorious, what remains is what? Much more glorious. Put that in the NLT for me. Look at this in the NLT, verse 11. For what if passing away was glorious? So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Now, notice what he says now. The old way was temporary. But this new covenant remains forever. It lasts forever. This was just a temporary covenant, the old covenant, but the new covenant is forever. Amen. It's forever. Are you seeing that? It's the law that disappeared, came with glory. The law which continues forever has much greater glory. So you see what Paul's laying down? That's why in the next verse, notice what he says. Let's move on to the next verse. Verse 13, I mean 12. Therefore, therefore is a continuation. Since we have such what? Hope. We use great boldness of speech. The reason I can speak so boldly about this new covenant of the grace of God, the reason I speak so boldly about the grace of God, because there's nothing in comparison to the old covenant. That old covenant, as great and glorious as it was when you watched the movie, The Ten Commandments or whatever, as great and glorious as it was, this new covenant that, that we're in is so much more greater. Why? Because here, God used to keep a record of our sins. In the new covenant, He's not counting your sins against you anymore. Here, you, you, anytime you messed up, you were cursed. Here, you've been redeemed from the curse. Here, you were sick. Here, you can be healed. Here, you were poor. Now, you can be made rich. Here, you were, you were condemned and now you've been accepted in the beloved. It's a far greater covenant. Amen? And so, therefore, we are bold about this new covenant because of the confidence it gives us. We have a better covenant built on better promises. Yes. Papa John's. <laughs> <laughs> better. I've been wanting to change our slogan so we can do that. Better covenant, better promises, Grace Church. But then I might get trouble. Anyway, but, uh, but, and that's why now you understand verses like this. I know I didn't tell you to write this one. Go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. Let me show you here. See, Paul said, man, we're bold about this. Why? Because notice, Jesus, so much more Jesus, has become a surety or a guarantee of a better covenant. Jesus, in other words, what do you mean Jesus is the guarantee? How many know under the old covenant, it's about what we had to do? Trying to keep the law. Trying to be good enough. Amen? But we weren't. But in the new covenant, it's not about us trying to keep the law, trying to see if we're good enough on our own. It's about Jesus who kept the law in our place and He now lives in us. And it says when you're under the Spirit, you're not under the law. Amen. So Jesus is the one. He's the guarantee that what? We're going to be living in a better covenant. Amen. With better promises. Yeah. Right? Look at Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. Here's the other reason Paul was bold. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator, there it is, of a better covenant which was established on what? Better promises. I told you, that's where Papa John got it from, right there. I think he got it from that verse. Better covenant, better promises. Amen? And, and then Hebrews 8, 7, if you, if you go to the next verse, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. If that, new, if that covenant was so good, then why did God replace it? You know why He replaced it? Not that, the, not that the law was not good. It's holy and just. It's that we were, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good. Baby, you're no good. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. You're no good, you're no good, you're no good. Baby, you're no good. Right? So he says, If the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Keep reading. Look at verse 8. Let's keep reading. Because finding fault with them, notice, he didn't find fault with the law. He found fault with us. <laughs> right? Finding fault with us. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Because why? Because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. 
Verse 10, For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws. Notice, under the new covenant, in the old covenant, it was about you got to do this, you got to do that. Under the old, I mean, under the old, that's you gotta, what you got to do. And then the new, it's about what he does. I, God says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on. The, well, we just read. It's the Spirit of God that writes it in your heart. And writes it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 11. Verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother says, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. In other words, you're not going to need a, a middle priest. Come on now. Amen. Jesus is our mediator now. You don't need somebody to show you. You, you can go to Jesus yourself. Amen. Come on now. For, oh, here's the good news. Here's the great clause of the new covenant. For I'm going to be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Amen. God doesn't remember your sins anymore. Amen. Your wife might remember your sins. Your boss might remember your sins. Amen. Amen. But God doesn't remember your sins. Your ex might remember your sins, right? But God doesn't remember your sins. I remember, I remember how you used to sin. Okay, Hebrews chapter... <laughs> Again, he puts it in our hearts. And we don't have to remember that anymore. Now, let's go back to 2 Corinthians. I could keep going, but let's go back because of time. Uh, there's pancakes waiting for us over there. More pancakes. Verse 13, look at this. Paul's saying, look, I got great boldness of speech. We have great confidence. I'm bold about this. Why? I'm not like, look at verse 13, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds, verse 14, were what? Blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. You see, that's why some Jews that are not saved, they don't get it yet. Boy, but when they turn to Jesus, and they understand, oh, it blows them away because they understand the Old Testament. See, and it says here, notice, and, and he says, uh, uh, the, 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 the veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is what? Taken away in what? In Christ. Amen? Let's keep reading. Uh, fi uh, 15. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Glory to God. Are you seeing what he's saying? See, Moses was hiding behind the veil, was hiding the glory that was passing away. We don't hide the glory of the new covenant anymore. We don't hide this glory of this new covenant of grace. The veil in understanding the old covenant is removed. How? When one turns to the Lord. The Jews nor we could not understand the Old Testament and the law until we turned to Jesus and the veil was removed. The Old Testament, why? Because once we, once we got saved and we look in the Old Testament, we see it's all about Jesus. They're all pictures. Uh, Joseph, remember Joseph when his brothers uh, sold him, sold him, uh, his brothers sold him to slavery, throw him in a pit. That's a picture of us, of, of Jesus, and us selling him out to, to die for our sins. Amen. It's, it's a, Joseph was a picture of Jesus. Amen. And, he, and, and he's the one that, that went before into Egypt to what? To bring salvation. Amen. Amen. And all these, and then you see pictures in the Old Testament about uh, of Jesus, the servant, the servant that, that that got set free after six years. Amen. All these pictures in the Old Testament. It's all about Jesus. The Ark. The Ark is a picture of, of salvation in Jesus. Judgment's coming to the world, but but the but the people of God go into the Ark. Jesus is the Ark of safety that you know, that saves us from judgment. Those are all pictures of Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ, amen? And so, and so when, when you're, the veil's removed, now we can see it. Now we can see it, amen? So now, check this out. I want you to go to the la, uh, last two verses, verse 17 first. But now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Liberty. 
Now, the, now is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. Liberty. So with an unveiled... Notice, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord is there to bring what? Liberty. I want you to put this in the CEV for me. Look at this. This is powerful. In the CEV, verse 17. The Lord and the Spirit are one and the same. And the Lord's Spirit sets us free. Now this is vital for you to understand. Because what are you talking about? You're talking about Jesus? Are you talking about the Father? Are you talking about the Holy Spirit? The Scripture says the Lord and the Spirit, the Lord Jesus and the Spirit are one. The same. Amen? God is manifesting Himself in three persons, but it's one God. Amen? And notice, so the Lord and the Spirit are one, and the Lord's Spirit sets us free. Amen. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. The Lord sets us free. So, if, so what is he saying? If you got the Lord Jesus, you got the Spirit. If you got the Spirit, you got the Lord Jesus. There's the one and the same. And whatever the Spirit of the Lord is, you have freedom. You got victory. Well, what happened when you, when, when you gave your life to Jesus? The Spirit of the Lord came to live inside of you. So guess where freedom is? Some of you... I don't think you understand this verse again. I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. Well, let's look at a different translation. The NLT. Put the NLT. Uh, uh, I mean, amplified. Amplified. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or emancipation from bondage. Freedom. Remember when Jesus quoted Isaiah 61? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He has anointed me to heal the sick, to, to, you know, to, to release the prisoners from darkness, amen? To, lay, you know, to, to heal the sick and, and to heal the brokenhearted. Are you seeing that? Well, that, well, that same Spirit that Jesus talked about, that the Spirit is, uh, is upon me to do these things, is now, oh, glory to God, living on the inside of you. Amen? The same one that cast out devils. The same one that healed the sick. The same one that, that, that got rid of oppression and depression in people's lives. The, that same one that, Jesus, that was in Jesus that was touching people. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling inside of you. Bringing freedom. Amen? Yeah, but pastor, I don't feel like I'm free. Well, I mean, that's your feelings. Amen? Amen? That's your feelings. Amen? But, but the scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. But here's, but here's the key though. You know how to, you, know, you want to change those feelings? Apply the, the word, the spirit to those feelings. Apply the word of God to those feelings. No, this is who I am when you're being tempted. Uh -uh, I am a new creation in Christ. I am the very righteousness of God in Christ. And you know what you're doing? You're releasing the spirit. And guess what? It'll change your feelings. Your feelings will calm down. You're, you're feeling fearful or anxious or worried or whatever. Oh no, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. See, it's up to you. You don't have to let it be afraid. Jesus said, don't let it be. How? I'm your peace. I'm giving you a peace that the world can't give you. Peace I leave. My peace I give to you. So, so Jesus said, I'm giving you. Now listen, do you think Jesus is peaceful right now? Do you think he's worried or fretful right now? As he is in heaven at peace, so are you in this world. He's not worried about nothing. I said he's not worried about nothing. Or nothing. For all you cowgirls and cowgirls. <laughs> are you seeing that? So glory to God. Wherever God's spirit is, there is freedom. So I have to acknowledge, thank you, Lord, that you are my freedom. When you're being tempted. Thank you, Lord, that you're my righteousness. Thank you, Jesus, you are my sound mind. You've not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love. Remember, APS on the inside. APS. <laughs> power and love and a sound mind. Amen? Pastor, I think I'm going crazy. No, you're not. You have a sound mind. Pastor, I'm getting into fear. No, you're not. You got a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. I'm going to make it. Because Jesus is my sound mind. He's my peace. Yes. Amen. Amen? And the chaos will start to subside Amen. as you speak your, the Spirit of God over yourself. Last verse. Last verse. Verse 18. 
But we all, with an unveiled face, oh glory to God, beholding as in a mirror the what? The glory of the Lord are being what? Come on now. You ever watch the movie Transformers? Come on, young people. Remember the movie Transformers? Yeah. Amen. So in the natural, in your circumstances, you might feel down. You might feel like a weak, you, may, you know, weak, weak individual, whatever. But listen, as, as, it's like, you know what you got to do? How many know like your electric car, if it's running low on battery, what do you have to do? You got to go plug it in, man. You got to go plug it in and re-energize, right, right? But here's a good thing. With the Lord Jesus, glory to God. As you, as you speak His Word, as you listen to His Word, it, what it does, it's energizing you. It's, there's a transformation that's happening, glory to God. Oh, see, what, see, see what He's talking about? Notice, as you behold, listen, as you behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, you are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, we need to put it in the NLT for me. Look at this, this is powerful. So all of us who have had the veil removed. See, if you're saved, the veil's been removed. You already got married. Come on now. You already got married to Jesus. You shouldn't have the veil over yourself anymore. Remove the veil. Some of you are walking like you're blind. He says, so all of us have had the veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. See me for me. See me and then amplified. All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as if we're looking in a mirror. We are being transformed into that same image from one degree uh, to the next <laughs> One degree of glory to the next degree of glory. And this comes from the Lord. Glory to God, who is the Spirit. And then finally, look at, look at the Amplified. Amplified. All of us with an unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are constantly being, what? Transfigured into His very own image in one ever-increasing splendor and from one, what? One degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, put it in the message for me for, to wrap it up. Look at this. Oh, man. You got shouting shoes on? Look at this. Put it in the message Bible, starting with verse 16. And when, whenever, whenever though they turn to face God as Moses did, God removes the veil, and there they are, face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is a living, personal presence. Not a piece of chiseled stone, the law. Come on now. Right? Amen. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it. All of us. Nothing between us and God. Our faces shining with the brightness of His face. And so we are what? Transfigured, much like the Messiah. And our lives are gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like Him. Here's the point. Here's the point. You want to see change in your life? You want to see change in your Christian walk? It comes from by beholding, not behaving. It comes by behold. Notice, it says, it's when, you, when you come to the Word and it says, oh, glory to God, I am the righteousness of God. What am I doing? I'm looking into the mirror of God's Word. I'm beholding who I am in Christ. And as I behold who I am, it, it changes me. Something on the inside is changing me. I'm already righteous and holy in my spirit, but He's working in my heart. The Spirit of God is writing righteous, Amen. holy, Amen. new creation. A non-slapper. <laughs> Non-worrier. Amen? Amen? Now I'm a true worrier for the Lord. See what I'm saying? So you see what I'm saying? As I'm reading the word that I'm dead to sin and I'm alive unto God when I'm being tempted, the Spirit of God is writing that in me and I leave that temptation. The, 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 the feelings the feelings start dropping. They start going down. I don't, I don't feel like what? Slapping anymore. I don't feel like beating somebody up anymore. I don't feel like... Why? Because 
the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Amen? And, and, and there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? I got the spirit of life of Christ Jesus is on the inside of me. Something on the inside is working on the outside. So listen, transformation comes from beholding. Listen, a, a, a butterfly, listen, a butterfly, remember? It, it was a caterpillar. It was a worm. You might feel like a worm today in your walk. Amen? But if you want to start seeing wings coming out of you, if you want to start looking like a butterfly, you need to what? You stay in the cocoon of God's Word. Glory to God. You stay look. Look, I don't care how I look outside. I'm going to look at what God says about me. This is the mirror you should be looking at every day. It says, I'm a saint. You used to be a name, but now you're a a saint. You're a saint. You're a new creation. Amen. You're righteous. I am holy. Amen. Amen. You see what I'm saying? I'm healed. I'm delivered from the powers of darkness and I'm translated. Amen. Oh, you see what I'm saying? Look into the mirror. Be transformation happens by beholding. It happens by looking. What you see is what you get. What you see, what you see, is what you get, is what you get now, baby. Some of you have been looking at the wrong thing. And you're getting what you're seeing. Amen? Well, pastor, I'm worried about this. I'm, well, that just shows me what you're looking at. You're looking at your trials. You're looking at your tribulations. That's where your focus is at. No wonder you're depressed. No wonder you're worried. No wonder why. You become what you behold. Amen? It's like the Phoenix Suns. You know, lately they've been losing so much and, and everything. And, and it kind of get down watching the Phoenix Suns play. Except last night, we beat the Lakers. <laughs> I felt better last night because I, I, I was looking at a winner. Hey, this year the Cardinals are going to the Super Bowl this year. I've been, I've been prophesying that. Amen. Are you seeing what's happening here? You become what you behold. Come on. Let's, for example, I remember when I watched the movie Titanic. That's all I could think about after watching that movie. You become what you behold. I was had dreams of the Titanic. I was dreaming, you know, and stuff like that. Don't go on a carnival cruise watching Titanic. Right? Don't watch Titanic and then go on a carnival cruise or something like that. Right? <laughs> well, you become what you behold. It affects you. But how much more the things of the Spirit. The Spirit of God writing in your heart and so forth. So listen, God the Father, you know what He did? He cut a covenant with Jesus Christ on the cross as our representative. And by doing that, He, he, he made a covenant as our on our behalf. And so He's the guarantee that you're going to get what Jesus paid for. Amen? And anybody who receives Jesus enters into that covenant. So Jesus is the guarantee that you're going to get all that God has for you. So how do you apply this in our lives this morning before we end? Behold the glorious truths of the new covenant. What are you looking at? Where's, what, see, that's, that's, a, that's, that's going to reveal where your faith is at. What you see is what you're going to get. Now, transformation comes by beholding, not behaving. Now, as you, as you, the more you get transformed, though, it'll affect your behavior. You, the more you know you're the righteousness of God in Christ, then, see, I, see some of you think, well, you, you don't talk much about the way you act and whatever. Well, listen, that's what I'm aiming for. But I'm going up another mountain. Religion has always gone up. Tell people, stop doing this, stop doing this, stop doing this. And it's never helped. Why? They're still sinning. Amen. Yeah, but if you just preach grace, 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 they're going to sin. No, no, no. They've been preaching without grace or gra with grace or without grace. But if they find out how much God loves them and who they really are in Christ, they'll start acting more on the outside what they are on the inside because you act the way you feel. And if you don't feel righteous and if you don't feel holy, I guarantee you, you won't act that way. Amen. So whether people realize it or not, your feelings affect you. So if you speak the word by faith, it'll affect your feelings and you'll start acting right. So, I want you to say this. We're going to say this 
In fact, I got to print those again. We, we had those brochures, In Him Realities. I did a whole series on them. We, it's like eight truths that you need to get a hold of of who you are in Christ. I'll print them next week and I'll have them there for you. Th those are scriptures. You, Pastor, I don't know where to study them. I have a, about, I don't know, a hundred and some scriptures on who you are in the Lord. Yeah. Study them. Read them. Find out who you are in Christ. But here's, here's one of the sen main sentences that puts all those scriptures together. I don't know if we still have those, uh, our identity sentence, if it's in there or not. But if not, I'll, I'm going to read it and say that together. I, I know we used to have it up, but I don't know if we, we have it. I, I, put it. I put it all in one sentence, the main things that, uh, of who we are in Christ. So I want to say this. Do you have it in there or no? Probably not. No? Okay. I want you to say this together. I want you to just repeat after me. Watch. And I want you to close your eyes when you say this. Amen. This is your identity. This is who you are if you're a believer. In one sentence. Repeat after me. Because of Jesus' death, death, burial, burial and, resurrection and resurrection for me, I am deeply loved, I am deeply loved fully, pleasing, fully pleasing, totally accepted, totally accepted completely forgiven, Thoroughly cleansed, Thoroughly cleansed. Righteous, righteous. Holy. holy justified. justified delivered, delivered. Graced, graced. Anointed. anointed strong. strong a, masterpiece, a masterpiece. A new creation. A new creation and, complete and complete. In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Let's say it one more time. Let's say it one more time. Keep your eyes closed. Say it one more time. Because of Jesus' death, death, burial, burial and, resurrection and resurrection for me, I am deeply loved, I am deeply loved fully, pleasing, fully pleasing, totally accepted, totally accepted completely, forgiven, completely forgiven, thoroughly cleansed, thoroughly cleansed righteous, righteous, holy, holy justified, justified, delivered, delivered graced, graced, anointed. anointed Strong, strong, a masterpiece, a, masterpiece, a, new, creation, a new creation, and complete, and complete in Christ Jesus. Amen. amen. Now, if you believe it, say amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father. Amen. You should be able to, you know, say it every morning when you wake up in the morning. This is who I am. Amen. I am who He says I am. Did you receive something this morning? I believe you did. I believe you did. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.